platform speaking, like persuasive, informative, or impromptu speaking or extemporaneous speaking, the more limited prep events, the things that I'm going to go over here today will apply to all of those events. So no matter what you're doing, as far as IEs are concerned, you kind of follow the same kind of um, system for what we're calling in-room etiquette. I don't really like the word etiquette. I like to think of it as more like um, how to feel comfortable in a room so that you fit in with everyone else. So that's kind of what we're going over. So how many of you have seen a posting before? Or even know what that is? All right, good, we'll start there. So the first thing that happens at a tournament is when you enter an event, they're going to put you into rooms with five or six to seven other people in whatever category of event you're competing in. So a posting will be up on the wall or sent out via the computer program that you can get signed up for. And we'll basically have your event at the top. So if you're doing, seems like a lot of people are interested in doing pros, so we'll pretend pros is happening. It'll have the event at the top. It'll have the start time. So it would be like 9.15 a.m. would be the start time. And then it's going to have a lot of little sections. And it'll say section one. And then it'll have a room and a judge. And then somewhere else on the paper, it'll have section two and a room and a judge. And so every section will be a different room, and those are the people who are competing against each other for that particular round. So you're looking for your speaker code. This is all language that it will be helpful for you to know and or your name. I would say most of the postings at our local tournaments will have both of these things. So everyone who competes at a tournament gets assigned a code. And that code is your team code, which is usually a letter combination. So like A, B might be your team. If you're at San Francisco City College, you might be A, B. If you're at Chico, you might be A, D. So everybody has a different code to start. And then each speaker, each individual person is assigned a number. So like 113. Okay, so let's say that I am A3, AB113. I know that because my coach tells me that before the tournament begins. So that's a question that you all should know to ask your coaches is what's my speaker code? Typically you'll have a little meeting when you get to the tournament and they'll either have a sheet with all the speaker codes on it so you can go through and find yours or they'll just tell you yours if it's a smaller team. Okay, so you need to know what your speaker code is and then hopefully you know what your name is. Uh, be sure to check with your coach though, this is important from a coaching perspective, is if you go, like you like to be called something else at school in class, but your, what you signed up for classes is one name and what you like to be called in class is a different name, check to see which name your coach put on here. Because I have been at tournaments where people have come up to me and said, I can't find myself on the posting. And really it's because I'm using the name that is on their registration and they're looking for me to use the name that we call them in class. So just make sure that you know what name is on there if you go by anything different. So under each section is going to be numbers and usually in something like prose, who can tell me how long a prose piece is typically? Eight to ten minutes. Eight to ten minutes, exactly. So typically in prose you won't have, hopefully, you won't have over seven people, and we try to stick it at six because we want each round to last about an hour. Okay, so impromptu, you may have seven or eight people because those are shorter speeches. Those are only seven minutes long. So it just varies by event how many people. But pros, we usually try to stick to six or less people so that we can get out of there in an hour, about an hour. Um, and so each person gets assigned a speaking order. This is important. This is the order in which the speaker should speak. So you need to know your speaker code, your name, and then once you find yourself, you should have your speaker order, the room number that you're in, and maybe either take a picture of it with your phone, if you're a phone user, so that you have that information once you leave or write it on a piece of paper. Some people write it on their hands, but you're gonna run out of room at the end of the day because <laughs> you're gonna do this a whole bunch of times throughout the day. So I would say have an index card or something if you're not gonna take pictures with your phone. Um, the reason you wanna have this written down is because let's say you're at San Francisco State University, which is where the first tournament takes place. Some of the rooms that you're going to go to are going to be in buildings that are a long walk. 
So if you try to remember this in your head and you get that long walk away and then you forget what room you were supposed to be in, you don't want to have to turn around and walk all the way back to where these postings are. They're only in one location. So always have this written down somewhere or a picture of it with you just in case you forget. Okay? And again, all that information is going to be up here on the posting, so you'll get all that information. So you're looking for your code on this list and probably your last name, so it would be like if it were me and I were AB113, it would probably say something like AB113 Peterson. And I would know that I was speaking second in that round. And then there might be AC101 Jones, AL316, uh, we'll put Mark in there. And then, you know, it would go on down the list. But you just want to know what your speaking spot is. Okay, so that's how you read a posting. Once you have that information, you're going to head off to whatever room number you're in. And it's going to be a classroom like this. And when you walk in, there will either be or you should make something that looks like this on the board. So we're doing prose, right? And then you put your own code and name in the spot where you're speaking and you just leave the rest blank. Okay, oftentimes when you're competing, this will already be in the room, but it might be there from the last round. So instead of saying prose, it might say impromptu, because that's what was in there before you. So you can just erase impromptu and write in prose in whatever round you're doing of prose. Okay, and then this lets the judge know who showed up. So if you don't do this, then as a judge, I don't know that you're in the room and we're ready to start. So until this is filled in, you're probably just going to hang out in that room. So if you're the first one to arrive, you just take a seat and wait for everybody else. And as people walk in, they will be filling in their information. So somebody else might walk in and they'll write their name and then they'll sit down. And then somebody else will walk in and they'll write their name and they'll sit down. Okay. Once this is filled in, or the judge feels like they waited enough time for people to get over and fill in, the judge will say, okay, you know, do we have everyone here? Let's go ahead and get started. So that's what you're waiting for, is the judge to be there with their ballots and to announce that you're going to start the round. Okay? Yeah, Mark. What if I happen to have two events at the same time? Ah, does anybody know about that? So you said that you were interested in impromptu? No, prose and persuasion. Okay, so let's say that at the tournament, prose and persuasion both start at 9.15, okay? That happens sometimes, and that's called being double entered, okay? so. Prose starts at 9.15, but then you also have persuasion at 9.15. And you're going to have a posting just that looks the same, except for it says persuasion at the top instead of prose at the top. And it's going to have the sections, just like it did over there. So let's say that I'm competing in uh, <coughs> persuasion and prose. So I'm second in section one in that room, and let's say I check the persuasion posting. Oops. And I'm sixth in this room for persuasion. I have to go compete in both of those rooms in the same time period. So from 9.15 to 10.30, let's say, because we usually give about an hour and 15 minutes for rounds to take place. So what I would do is say, okay, I'm going to speak second in this room and sixth in this room. So I probably want to be in this room, give my pros, and then I want to leave and go over to this room to do my persuasion because there will be five people speaking before me. But I have to remember what we talked about. The reason for this list is so judges know that people are there. So I have to figure out, how do I let my persuasive judge know that I'm there if I'm over competing in pros? And the answer is that I go there and I sign in on the list first, and then I go back and actually compete in my pros round. So in the persuasion round, 
I would walk in the room. And if I was the first one there, I would make my list. And I would sign in here. But I would put after my name, DE, which just signals to the judge that I'm double entered and I would leave because I'm going back to my pros round to do my pros. But now the judge knows that I'm at the tournament, that I know that I'm in this room, but I'm somewhere else giving a speech and that I will return at some point. So if for any reason all five of these speakers get through before I get back, which is highly unlikely if I'm the second speaker in this round, uh, but if that were to be the case, the judge would know to wait for me. They wouldn't get up and leave thinking that everything was done because no one signed in. So some of you who are doing two events, you have to figure out if those two events are happening at the same time at the tournament. Um, and there probably will be some overlap between some of your events, so because there's only two what we call patterns. So half of the speeches happen at one time period, and then half of the speech types happen at a second time period. So if you're doing two events, there, you'll often have some overlap between them. All right. Oh, and then I would write double entered over here too when I signed in, because as soon as I'm done giving this speech, I'm going to leave. I'm going to ask the judge, may I be excused? I have to go give a speech in another room. Okay. Um, I would just add, so that y'all are aware of when you're speaking, if you walk into the pros room and you're the second speaker, your judge is going to see double entered and ask you to speak first, so that you can then get out to your other round. So be prepared for that. Yeah, judges are trying to manage that for you, help you manage that. When they know you're double entered, they're trying to help you make sure that you can get to both rooms within the time period that's given to you. So they're going to try to help facilitate that by moving you up earlier if you're speaking early in that room or hanging around and waiting for you to come in if you're speaking late in that room. Sometimes it does happen that you're the fourth speaker in both rooms. If that's the case, then you want to just make sure that you decide. That's kind of your choice then, right? Your call, where you want to go. But once the judge knows that you're double entered, they're probably going to move you up to first. They're going to say, oh, so-and-so's double entered, let's go ahead and let them speak so they can go to their other round. So even though it says you're the fourth speaker, we'll make, as judges, we kind of make decisions to help you get to your other round when you need to be there. Yeah. What if you have multiple people who are double entered? Yeah, so that happens all the time. So sometimes you will literally give a speech in front of two people because your judge will be sitting there and only one other competitor because everybody else is out competing in their other rounds. Um, and so that's just the way that it works, but you might have less people in your room if there's multiple people who are double entered. And as people get better, so as you move up into open, you will actually see people that are triple entered, meaning they're doing three speeches during that one hour period. So they're literally going to one room giving a speech, going to another room giving a speech, and going to another room giving a speech all within an hour. It's rare, but it happens. All right, so any questions about that? And your coaches can help you out with this system by letting you know if someone else is competing in the same event. They may be in a building so that you don't have to walk over and come back. Maybe one of your teammates is also doing pros and they're in the room next door. They can go into this room and sign in for you. So that saves a little bit of walking distance. On campuses like um, San Francisco State, the tournament you have to walk a long way, so sometimes that's helpful if you have a team where you have other competitors doing similar events. Always kind of scan and see if they're in the same building. They can go sign in to you for your double entry so you don't have to walk back and forth twice. Okay. A lot of times tournaments are trying to manage that too, so they're trying to put rooms closer together because they know people are having to walk. Um, is there like a limit on how many events you can so you can't be more than triple entered ever, and in some, at some tournaments, because of the layout of the tournament or because of the events that are taking place during that time, you can't be more than double entered. They'll even make that restriction. So, but um, no one can do more than three because there's just no way time-wise that you can make that work. There's no such thing as a quadruple entry, so yeah. All right, other questions? Okay, so this is kind of the pre-round etiquette, is making sure that you have all the information that you need. So that was your ID number, your competitor ID number. Um, you want to know what room you're competing in. 
You want to know what speaker number you are. Those are key pieces of information that everyone should know. Once the postings go up, that's the first thing you're looking for. A lot of teams will manage this because once postings go up, there's like a rush of people who come over trying to see things. And these are on eight and a half by 11 sheets, so they're pretty small. It's like that piece of paper over there. You can imagine if it has like six sections on it, that it's hard to see your name. So what a lot of teams manage to, or do to manage this is they have one team member who goes over to the posting, takes a picture, and then texts that out to everyone else for that particular event. So if you're doing pros, you get that on your phone and it's automatically saved in your phone. I think that's a great idea to put someone in charge of that if your coaches don't already do that. Just, you know, if you know that four of you are doing pros, pick one of you and say, hey, you're in charge of taking photos, here's our numbers, text those to us. Um, just make sure that whoever's doing that is taking a picture of everyone. There might be multiple sheets of pros or persuasion, so there might be two pages because there's more than six sections. Okay, so they have to take pictures of everything. All right, so. Okay, so pre-round, pre that's the etiquette for pre-round. Now, once you're in the round, so you've signed in, you've taken a seat, um, here are some things that you wanna keep in mind. You wanna make sure that when you're sitting in a room, you never sit in the front row. Can anybody think of why you might not wanna do that? The what? Flash zone. <laughs> Hopefully people aren't spitting or anything, although it does happen in debate rounds sometimes. People spit on people. Uh, but no, especially when your judge isn't in the room yet, your judge should always be able to see the entire front of the room, which means if everybody comes in and sits in the front row, the judge has to sit behind someone, which is awkward for a judge because now I can't see. I'm like, you know, oh, can I see that person over the person sitting in front of me? So you always want to kind of leave the first couple of rows open or sit to the sides so that the judge has a clear spot to watch people in. So just make sure that you're not sitting somewhere right in the middle of the room in the front because that's often where the judge is going to want to sit or at least you know two or three rows back. Typically judges want to sit in the middle of the room so they have full view of the room and they don't want anyone sitting directly in front of them. So if you did do that, a judge may say, oh, Sorry, but can you just move a couple of desks over um, just so they have visibility? So they're not trying to be rude to you. They're just trying to make sure that they can see everything. This is especially important in things like uh, oral and chirp because a lot of what you're doing is body. And so we want to see your whole body, and we don't know exactly where you're going to go in the room, so we want to make sure that everything is visible to us. So that's a lot of times why judges are particular about where people are sitting in the room. So when you come in, it's much easier if you just kind of move to the, one of the two sides and you sit in the second or third row back. Um, second thing is you should have nothing in front of you once the round begins. So if you have your index cards that you have your speech written on, um, that can be sitting on the desk, but it should be turned over. You do not want to have anything out that you're looking at. If you have your black book out, you should have it closed in front of you because your job when you're not speaking and around is to be a good audience member. And what I like to tell people is when you're first starting in speech and debate, you may not always be the best competitor in the room, so you may not always be, have the best pros or be the best performer or be the best speaker. You can always be the best audience member. Everyone's capable of that. And so the three rules that I have for audience members are be attentive, which means you don't have anything distracting, your eyes are on the performer, and be supportive, so you're giving them nonverbal feedback that is supportive. Be aware of your nonverbal signals. And that's hard sometimes when you're nervous, because a lot of times we get these kind of pinched faces when we're nervous, so we're kind of like, mm, I'm really nervous about giving my speech. And someone's up here speaking, and they think you're giving the pinched face to what they're saying. And they're like, oh gosh, they hate my speech. And that can be really, especially for new speakers, that can be really intimidating for them. Like, everyone in here hates my speech, when really everybody is just nervous about what they're doing, their own speech. So be really aware of your nonverbals. Try to smile, nod your head, make eye contact, look like you care about that person, because it makes a huge difference for the person who's up here in front of the room. Um, you're not going to get judged on that. You know, the judge is going to be like, wow, you were a great audience member. If you are a bad audience member, though, you are going to get judged on that. So as a judge, if I look around the room and I see you with your black book open, reading your piece, trying to remember it while someone else is speaking, I will make a comment on your ballot. 
and say, you know, you need to be a more attentive audience member, pay attention to the speakers, because I think it's really important. Again, I harp on the fact that this is community. You should care about the person who's in front of the room and how they feel about their speech. And if you're not even paying attention to them, that's sending a signal to them that you don't care about them. Okay, so be a good to great audience member in every single round. Uh, don't be distracted, be attentive, be aware of your nonverbals, and try to be supportive. Okay? Yeah, I would just add that there are judges in the community that will penalize your performance mm -hmm. based off of how you are as an audience member. Yeah, I don't typically do that. I just write a note about your, you know, being a bad audience member because I think your coach will read that and hopefully, you know, give you some advice on how not to do that in the future. But there are some judges who will be punitive towards you. As, so you can have the best prose in the round, but because you were reading it while someone else was performing, maybe you get third or fourth. And they'll write on the ballot that that's why you got third or fourth, but you just don't want that to happen. Okay. Questions about that? So audience member, being a good audience member is important. All right, third thing about being in a room is you, I think community is important, so I encourage you to get to know each other so you can talk to each other, but don't be talkative. I know that sounds weird, but when you're in a room, especially when the judge is present, you are being judged. It's sad but true. <laughs> so as soon as the judge walks in a room, they are judging you. Uh, They're judging you as uh, a competitor, right? So if you're sitting and carrying on a conversation right up until the point that the round starts, and that conversation maybe, so I have, these are the things that I have witnessed as a judge that I have felt uncomfortable with. I have had competitors who have been talking about other people's performances in previous rounds. Oh my gosh, did you see the girl who's doing that piece on blah, blah, blah? I can't believe that she's doing that. It was so bad. Did you see her? She didn't even have anything memorized. And I'm sitting there as a judge and I'm like, okay, first of all, how do you know that that's not my competitor, right? That could be my student from my school. <laughs> and second of all, even if it's not my student from my school, that's just snarky. And I don't view you as being a very nice person. So even though I'm not judging you as a forensics competitor, I'm judging you as a person when you're doing that kind of thing. So don't do that. Um, you know, you can carry on, you know, you should introduce yourself. You can say, you know, how's your day going? Very generalized conversations with each other. You should not talk to a judge unless the judge talks to you. I will tell you that I am primarily, I did primarily debate when I competed. I did IEs. My biggest thing, converting over to IEs was there's a lot of unwritten rules about IEs um, that are different than debate. So in debate, you often have conversations with your judge before and after a round. You ask them where they're from and kind of like what their view on debate is. And then after the round, you ask how you did. Um, that happens in debate. That does not happen in IEs. You should never ask a judge about your performance in IEs until after the tournament is over like the complete tournament is over. So you don't get a lot of feedback. Now, your coach may go and talk to that person and get feedback for you and bring that to you, but do not go and ask a judge about your performance. Um, part of that is because you know, you're being ranked in a round with six other people, and it's awkward for us to talk to you about your performance while we're still figuring out where that ranking is gonna go. So that's the reason we often don't talk to you after, right after the round. But then another thing is that we don't necessarily want you focused on changing your piece between round one and round two. You know, you've got a speech memorized, you should go with that speech. We don't want you making changes until after the tournament is over. Um, so when the judge comes in, you can certainly say hello. I would say once the round is over, you should thank the judge for judging. Um, a lot of people, you know, I get paid for doing this, but a lot of people show up at tournaments just because they love forensics and they're doing it totally free. They're not getting paid. So it's nice for competitors to recognize that they've taken the time out of their weekend to come and do something to help you out. Um, and so I think it's always a good idea when you finish the round to say thank you for judging, and then you can leave. You don't need to shake hands, you don't need to do any of that stuff. Um, just say thank you for judging, okay? So very limited conversation in the room, especially when the judge is present. Uh, because it's distracting to other competitors while they're trying to memorize their speeches and things like that, but then it also could lead to a conversation that is not good to have in a, in a round. 
And if someone else engages in that conversation, I would just be like, oh, you know what? I really need to work on my speech. Just, you don't need to be rude, but just shut it down. Don't look like you're engaging in it. Okay, any questions about that? All right, um, last thing that I would say is be on time or be early, because that's really important. Tournaments will often run late, people should not. Okay, tournaments will often run late, but people should not run late. So your round may have been scheduled to start at 9.15 a.m. This piece of paper may not actually go on the wall, just like today. So we were supposed to start this particular lab at 9.15, but you didn't even get released from the cafeteria until around 9.25, right? It's still gonna say 9.15 a.m. You know that it's not really gonna start at 9.15 a.m. You should just, anytime that the time has already passed what it says on the posting, you should assume that that round should start as soon as possible, which means you should kind of run or walk quickly, okay? So get to your room as quickly as you can, get signed in, don't take your time, don't you know, try to avoid having to go to the bathroom right before round start, do that before the postings come out. Um, but you should just try to make that start as soon as possible. Um, if it says 9.15 a.m., that's when they wanna be starting the round, not when you should be looking at the posting. So you'll get a schedule, every tournament, you'll get a schedule before the tournament starts and it will have the start time for rounds on there, you should assume that postings will go up about 10 to 15 minutes before that start time in the hopes that you will get that information and get to your room so that someone can be speaking at 9.15 a.m. Okay, don't check the postings at the start time. Check the postings 10 to 15 minutes. If they're not there, just hang out and wait for them. Because again, tournaments are often running late that you should be waiting for that information and you should head off to your round as soon as that information is available. Okay? Typically, tournaments will have two or three posting areas. Um, they'll have one major posting area and then they might have another. A lot of times that second posting area is now via, uh, via your phone or electronic device. So they will actually send out the postings to you electronically. You have to sign up for that service before the first tournament. It's um, if the tournament, so at, at Golden Gate Opener, which is the first tournament at San Francisco State, there's a program called tabroom.com, and that program is being used by the tournament, and whenever they print these, it also gets sent to the internet. And if you have signed up ahead of time, it will send you an email saying, here's where you're competing. It just says, you're in pros, um, you know, in this room, and you're in persuasion in this room, and this is your speaking number. It's really nice to be signed up for that information. So if your coach doesn't tell you about that, it's worth asking about, because they can probably help you get signed up for it before the tournament. But there will still be paper posting somewhere. So even if you don't have a phone or your phone dies during the tournament, you can still get the information. Okay? All right. Um, I think I covered everything that I wanted to cover. Are there any questions before I let you go? So you have a little break. Yeah. Okay, let's say you have two students for a double ended. Let's say student A is number three and you're student B. But student A is finishing up a speech at some other round and then you're waiting for students A to come and finish, to come give their speech at uh -huh. your round, but you're number five at a different investment. The judge, yeah. So if someone is it has marked this, so if I'm a judge in the room and I see that this is marked, but that person is gone, mm -hmm. then I will typically just let everyone else who is present speak. But I will ask you to stay for the duration of the round that would typically be happening. So you might sit there for a while after you give your speech waiting, because I like to have audience members. So even though you're done and there's no one left to speak right now, I know that this person is coming, so I might just say, oh, we're gonna take a really quick break until Peterson shows up, they should be here any time. At that point, if you wanna take out your phone and check messages and stuff, there's no one speaking, so I think that's fine. Um, and the judge is just gonna have you sit there until they show up. So never leave a room without asking the judge to be dismissed, uh, because that's kind of rude, just to be like, mm -hmm. <laughs> So if you are done Leonard and you forgot to write DE, feel fine just saying, you know what, I totally forgot to write this, but I am double Leonard and I'm going to another room. But otherwise, you know, if the round is running late and the judge is just sitting there, they will dismiss you. 
So they'll say, you know what, it looks like Peterson's not going to show up. We've got another round going, so why don't you, I'll, I'll wait, but you go ahead and leave and go check the postings. Judges are usually pretty good, unless they're brand new, they're usually pretty good about managing your time as well, especially when you're in a novice round because they realize that you're new. So they'll try to make sure that you know, you know, oh, postings are probably going up, you should probably head out, things like that. Okay? Yeah. Um, a couple things. One, something you should do to help the judge manage what's going on is strike through the DE mm -hmm. when it's your second round, right? So it's not the first one you went to, you went the second. Two, be very conscious of how you enter the room. Mm -hmm. right? oh, Make good. sure oh, that yes. nobody else is speaking, that. that you're not interrupting the speech, and when you come in, don't announce, hey, I'm here, right? Because the judge is probably like vigorously taking notes or trying to think about something. Um, so just walk in, cross off the DE. So I'll demonstrate that for you. So if that's me, who's DE speaker number six, I would first come up this this door has a window, which is kind of nice. So the first thing I would do is look through the window and see if I could see anybody in front of the room. So I see that everybody's sitting there. There's nobody in the front of the room. I would slowly open the door quietly. Because for all I know, somebody's standing over here giving their pros. <laughs> and I can't see them. So I'm not just going to throw open the door and run in. So I open the door quietly. I listen for a second to make sure I don't hear anybody presenting any information, if that's the case. I walk in. I walk to the front of the room. Hopefully there's a pin up there. If there's not a pin, I would just do this. And then I would have a seat without saying anything. You've communicated to the judge that that's you and you're here and ready to compete. If there was a pin, I would just take it and strike through the DE. Okay, and have a seat. And again, Mark's right. The reason for that is because oftentimes we're trying to write down what we remember of the speaker who just spoke. So even though someone's not up here speaking, the judge is doing something. We're trying to write down notes about the speaker who just spoke. So don't come in and start talking immediately. Um, and then if you're leaving a room, as soon as you finish presenting, so while you're still up in front of the room, if I'm the second speaker and I've just finished my prose, I would say, I'm double entered, is it okay if I go to my other round? And I wait for the judge to say, yeah, that's fine, go ahead. And then I would say, thank you for judging, because I'm not going to be there at the end of the room. So I would say, thank you for judging, and I would leave the room. Okay? Thank you. Yeah, I totally forgot about that. And that's true, really, even when you show up for a round, because tournaments run behind. So there may still be another round from the previously scheduled time period happening in the room that you've been scheduled in for the next time period. So just listen at the door, look in the window if there's a window. Make sure that there's not people up in front of the room performing. Yeah. Do not walk in in the middle of someone's speech and say to the judge, we're supposed to be in this room. <laughs> yes. <laughs> Which has happened multiple times to me. <laughs> Don't do that. Yeah. It really hurts the competitor. Like It's super unfair to them. And it puts the judge in a really awkward spot where now they have to, like, not reprimand, but like use a stern voice to get you out of the room uh -huh. right? and send you back to TAB or somewhere else. Um, what are the main things that are judged? Is there like a, is there a guideline, guideline? Yeah, so every event has slightly different things that a judge is looking for. Um, in prose interpretation, we're looking for kind of four major things. So we're looking for characterization. So if you have a character in your piece, can I tell who that character is through your voice, through your body, through all of that? Does your piece have a good arc? story arc to it, which means in 10 minutes, did you, was there something cohesive told to me? Or was it just kind of a story that went nowhere? So your 10 minute piece or eight to 10 minute piece should have some kind of story. So if you're doing poetry, that story is a little bit different narratively than if you're doing you know, drama or something like that. There's, the, the story is a more general term than are there characters and is there a plot and things like that. But it's just, there should be a message that I feel like I got from it. Third thing is, do you, does your performance seem, how would I say this? Um, it seems like a performance. So a lot of times as a novice, you might just be reading something. Reading is different than performing. Does that make sense? Mm -hmm. So it's not that you have to have everything memorized necessarily. You might read parts of it, but that 
that should still be performed just like you would on a play stage. Um, or if you're thinking, like listening to the radio when they do performances, how does that vocalization allow you to see pictures in your mind? That's what you're aiming to do in interpretation. So I want to see a performance, not just someone reading something to me. Um, and then the last thing that people look for is some kind of thesis or argument to the piece. So what, what is the point of you spending eight to 10 minutes sharing these pieces with me? Um, and that often comes across in your introduction. Mm -hmm. So your introduction kind of explains to the judge, here's what I'm trying to do with this piece, and then the judge is evaluating whether that actually worked or not, okay? In platform speeches, we're looking for all of the traditional things that you probably learned in a public speaking class, which is organization, content. We want you to do research. This is an academic event, so we want you to demonstrate that you've done some research. We want good delivery skills. So we want good eye contact, fluid delivery. We want you using a speaker's triangle, uh, which means on every point you're moving to a different place in the room. Um, so all of the traditional things we just expect you to go above and beyond because you're giving the same speech over and over again, which means it should be getting better and better. Okay? Yeah. Anything to add? Um, I guess just a piece about getting through the day, not how to act during the mm -hmm. day. As we've already, Sue's already talked about, there's a lot of walking around. So if your performance shoes aren't comfortable, please, please, please make sure that you bring an extra pair of shoes to change into either for the end of competition or for in-between rounds. It'll really help you uh, make sure you have water and some snacks because sometimes the lunch is really spread out and you know we don't want people passing out or being parched throughout the whole time. And it helps a lot when you're speaking, right? We both teach, so for us, we know that if you're speaking for an extended amount of time, you're gonna, your mouth is gonna get dry and it's gonna become difficult. So having water really helps in terms of that also and it really helps your performance. Yeah, and talk to your coaches because every team is different. So I know teams that bring an ice chest with them and so they have waters for you and they have snacks for you. Some teams don't do that and they kind of put it on you, you know, bring what you want to eat, bring what you want to drink. Um, they will often, your coaches will often have been to the tournament before so they can tell you if there's something open on campus where you can buy stuff. Because sometimes the, the store is open, sometimes the cafeteria is open, sometimes everything on campus is closed. Um, so, for example, today in San Ro at Santa Rosa, the, none of the food stuff is open. But I know, because I've been here a ton of times, I can tell my students, you know what, there's a couple of coffee shops and a Taco Bell like within five minute walking distance. So ask your coaches ahead of time, because they can give you a lot of information about the place where you'll be, even if you're unfamiliar with it. We go to the same locations every year for our tournaments. So I've been to the GGO tournament 23 times or something. So I know exactly what's everywhere at GGO because I've been there so many times. So you know, ask somebody who's an experienced competitor or ask your coach and they'll be able to give you more information. But yeah, it really is, it's a long day, often without a lot of full meals um, because we often run behind schedule. So you're getting there at 8.30 in the morning and you're not gonna leave there until 8.30 at night. So have what you need with you. <laughs> All right. Okay, I'm going to give you a break. So that gives you about seven minutes to go to the bathroom, get a drink of water, or whatever you need to do. And then I think you're coming back in here for the next one. Is that right? I think there's multiple ones. Yeah, yeah. Oh, you get to pick this one? Okay. You can be in here. Okay. If you right. do the other ones, then... There are another room. Yeah. Okay. All right. Nice been. meeting you all. If you see me at a tournament and you have a question, and I would say this of any of the, the people who are teaching labs today, if you see us at a tournament and you have a question and you're flustered and you don't know what to do, don't feel like you have to go find your coach. Come find someone who you know is experienced as a competitor or a coach and ask them. We are more than happy to help anyone out. So don't feel like you can't ask a question because we're not your coaches. We'll help you out. <laughs>